This message is part of the teaching provided by House on the Rock Fellowship, a church caring for the Miami Valley region. Before you listen, be sure to access the notes in the download section of the message page. Have a Bible ready. Thank you for being our guest. I remember moments, certain moments. I remember the moment when I heard Jesus, about Jesus for the first time. Small boy in a small rural church, Sunday school teacher sharing the story with me. I remember that moment. I remember the moment where I almost cut the tip of my finger off. My mom took me to the ER and they took a giant syringe and shoved it down the end of my finger. But more than I remember my mom holding my hand, her presence reminding me that everything's going to be okay. I squeezed that hand of hers. I remember that moment. I remember the moment when I started a new college. I had left, uh, transferred from a college in Texas and went to Cedarville. And before school begun in Cedarville, they had a service for all new students transferring and freshmen. And I remember in that service, my mom and my dad sitting with me and just having a moment of prayer. I remember that moment. I remember the moment when I drove uh, my firstborn son home for the first time from the hospital. Just paranoid. Just scared to death. Every single inch of the way. I remember that moment. I remember the moment when we as a church family, House on the Rock, shared communion for the first time. It was Easter. About six years ago. Moments that fill my life with joy. Moments that fill my life with love. I look back at them and I smile. They're awesome moments. They give delight. I love these moments. I have other moments in my life. I remember when a mentor of mine, first thing in the morning after an elders meeting, came up to me and said, are you an idiot? in front of the church secretary. I just asked the simple question in an elders meeting. His response to me the next morning was, are you an idiot? I still have that feeling when I think about that moment. I remember being at another church and an older woman came up to me. She said, Paul, you're a fool. Older women do that a lot to me. feels like it. Not really, but she did. Paul, you a fool? Voice dripping with contempt. Rage on her face. I remember after about five months of a candidating process for another church, be a lead pastor in Pittsburgh. It takes about five months to hire a pastor. It's hell for everybody. But for some odd reason, that's just what they decide to put pastors through. You have meetings and phone calls and phone calls and meetings and you drive out there and you visit and you preach and there's more meetings and yep, 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 made it to the first cut, made it through the second cut, made it through the third cut. Hey, it's just between you and two other people. Hey, we're really, God's doing a great work here. I remember getting the phone call. You know, God, we feel, is leading us to go with this guy instead. Yeah. I can still feel that here. Isn't that crazy? I remember that moment. I remember that moment when I, I did that other thing. Moments that take our joy and take our love and take grace. Moments that make Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday seem like a pipe dream. Moments that still shape me and moments that still I can feel like an old injury that's never really healed. 
Do you have that? Do you know that feeling? It could have been decades ago, but it feels like it happened this morning. Do you have those moments? We've been in this season of preparation. We call Lent. We've learned about words like wilderness and words like heart. and What those are. We've learned about cross. The invitation to come out into the wilderness. To be shaped by God. We've learned about this, this, this covering, this tent that God places over his people called community. This communal place where God speaks prophetically yet pastorally to us to change us, to move us on. Last week we talked about the work of the faith. But this week we need to talk about some moments or some of us will never make it to Easter. You'll never make it to Good Friday. And so this morning... It is my prayer that Jesus comes for you the way he's come for me in my life. And the way he came for a young man named Peter in the gospel. I want to take you through seven scenes in Peter's life. Seven scenes of his preparation, his transformation. And in that Maybe we can find hope to move through all of life's moments, no matter what type they might be. So make sure you have a copy of the scriptures. Uh, there's Bibles in front of you. And Lil will have some verses up on the screen when we get to them. Also, you want to have a set of notes that you received when you walked in. Um, might want to find, you'll find some things that maybe you want to write down and remember. Let's look at some key moments in Peter's life as we talk about the moments that shape us and change us. To begin with, you need to see Peter as he first was when Jesus, before Jesus bumped into him. He went by Simon. Simon, he fishes. That's what he does. He's a hard worker, successful businessman. Part of the family business, his dad was probably a fisherman. He fished, his brother fished, and he was relatively good at a hard job. He's a longshoreman. Spends hours out catching fish, preparing fish, selling fish. This is how he makes a good living to the best that he can. Has a family, all the drama that goes along with family. Some of you know about that. He tries to be a faithful Jew to the best of his ability. Serve and follow God to the best that he can. While living in a land under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And all the conflict that comes along with that. I hope that you could, in a bit, relate to Simon. He's doing the best, works hard, loves his family, tries to serve his God. This is Simon. You can see that in the top of the timeline. Simon, he's fishing. But something happens in Simon's life. Jesus, this rabbi, this itinerant speaker, shows up in his circle, shows up in his town. And he'd seen Jesus, he'd heard Jesus wrestled with some of the things that Jesus had said, heard about miracles and heard, heard about all the things that he could accomplish. And Jesus comes up to Simon and says, follow me. You have to understand that's, that's life altering. As far as Simon knows, his whole life is going to be one thing, fishing that lake, selling the fish in that town, living in that space. That's his existence. And Jesus comes up to Simon and says, hey, follow me. For a rabbi to come up to you, especially a rabbi of this type and caliber, I mean, he's already got a little bit. People flock to hear what Jesus has to say. And then Simon hears the words, follow me. There's honor in that. There's opportunity in that. There's, there's blessing and privilege in all of that invitation He's excited. He feels wanted. He feels welcomed in. Do you know that feeling? When someone says to you, I want you to be a part of our story. There's a seat at the table for you. Isn't that what we all want? To walk in the door 
and see someone's face light up because they see, they see ours. Now let's dial down because Peter's life, Simon's life moves forward with Jesus and he begins this season of very formal, intense preparation. One year, two years, in a very significant moment, which we've preached on. This is in Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has all of his followers, his his close disciples around him. They're in a place called Caesarea Philippi. And he's teaching about the kingdom. And he asks him, hey, who do people say that I am? Oh, some say you're this, some say you're this. There's rumors about this. There's rumors about that. There's always rumors. There's always speculations. And then Jesus turns and looks at Simon and says, who do you say that I am? Who do you think I am? And Simon, in this amazing moment, inspired by the Holy Spirit, nonetheless, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Out of the park, well done, Simon. That is the right answer. That is, and all of it, Jesus even explodes in excitement. He's like, Simon, son of John, exclamation point. Yes. There you go. Mm. And listen to this passage. This is in Matthew 16, verse 18. Lola, could you bring this up? I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You were Simon who fishes. Now you're Peter. You're going to build a church. You are part of building the church. Let's write that down in the block. Let's write that down. You're Peter. Build my church. Build my church. Your story's changing. You're moving in a different direction. There's this gift of identity in this moment. There's a gift of purpose in this moment. There's a reason now to keep going. And the words of Jesus go straight at Peter's heart. And we see Peter rise and be a leader amongst the disciples. A leader among followers. People would have recognized, that's Peter. Wherever Jesus goes, there's Peter. There's Peter. There's Peter. There's Peter. There's Peter. Rising to what we call this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Palm Sunday as we remember it today. And the parade of followers gathers. People are singing and they're laying down their coats and they're throwing down palms and they're calling out, Hosanna to the son of David. And you're that guy's right-hand guy. This collision course happens with, with the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And you watch as your rabbi goes to the temple and lays into the powers that be on a daily basis. Calling them out on Monday. Calling them out on Tuesday. Calling them out on Wednesday of this week. And he rises up to what we call the Last Supper a Passover meal where Jesus imparts a fresh teaching and a new word. But then the room starts to change a little bit as Jesus steps back and he says, hey, um, they're going to strike me down in a little bit and you're going to scatter. Peter ain't gonna have any of that. Uh oh, no, 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 no. They might, not me. I will go to the end with you. I will, I will fight for you. I will die for you. In fact, it says this in, in Matthew, in Matthew 26. Lilith, can you bring it up? Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples are like, Yeah, what he said. What he said. Write this down in your notes. I'll die for you. You're, you're my Jesus. I'll die for you. You've done so much. You've changed my life. I, I will die for you. But moments later, all goes 
terribly wrong. Jesus is arrested in the garden. One of their circle betrays him with a kiss, Judas, and the disciples flee. Jesus is bound, carried, and thrown through a series of political hula hoops until he finds himself in the house of Caiaphas. Now, John, one of the disciples, has good connections in Caiaphas's house, and so he's able to get past the guards into the court, and Peter is following along uh, in, in the distance. And in that moment, something happens. And I'd like to read it to you, if I could, please. This is Matthew 26, the last part of the chapter. Matthew 26. Let's look at another moment. Matthew 26, starting in verse 69. I'll read down to 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant came up to him and said, you're also with Jesus, the Galilean. And Peter denied it before them all, saying, I, I don't know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl said to him, he said, but the, she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly, you too are one of them. Your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. In that scene, let's write this down. I am not a follower. I am not a follower. Interesting thing in the Gospel of Matthew, Peter is written off the page at this point. To the remainder of Matthew's Gospel account, Peter never comes up again. So we kind of have to go to the other gospels to grab another scene, which I think is going to be really helpful for us. It's after the resurrection. Uh, it's after the upper room where Jesus has appeared to all the disciples. He's appeared to Peter and to Thomas. And, and there have been conversations. And Jesus, hey, I want you to head up to Galilee. Let's get out of Jerusalem. It's a little stressful right now. I'll meet you up in Galilee. So Peter and a few of the others head up towards Galilee their home area. And so jump to John, please. In the end of John's gospel, John 21. I want you to grab another moment. John 21. Again, we're after the resurrection. We're after conversations in the upper room. Peter has seen Jesus on multiple occasions. But there's something in this moment, I think, tells us something about where he's at. In John 21, verse 3, it says this. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Some of you are like, well, what's wrong with that? I think it's Peter's way of saying, I'm going back. So maybe in that scene, let's write that down. I'm going fishing. This is the Simon who was fishing and was going to keep on fishing because that's what the family business was, who had an encounter with Jesus, where Jesus, follow me. And he begins this amazing preparation period where he testifies to the very nature of Jesus. And Jesus says, you're Peter. I'm going to build a church with you. You're my guy. Peter, who's seen amazing miracles. Peter, who's been a part of amazing teaching and ministry opportunities. This guy. 
Peter who marches alongside of Jesus into Jerusalem. Peter who sees Jesus do amazing things and confront the hypocrisy of the systems of power. Peter that said, I will never leave you. I will fight with you. I will die with you. We're in this to the end. Who denied him three times and said, I'm just going back. How did we get from, I'll die for you, to I don't know him? I'm just going to go back to fishing. What derailed Peter? What sabotaged his story? What broke the momentum of this key follower of Christ? There's something between this Passover supper and crucifixion morning. It's something demonic. I assure you, it is demonic at its core. There's a the conversation, there's just a glimpse of a conversation in Luke's account. This interaction where Jesus says to Peter, you need to know that Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. I've prayed for you. Pete, guys, you need to know. Hell's coming for you. So there is something very demonic at play. But it's also something parasitic. You know what a parasite is, right? Something from the outside that kind of attaches to you. Maybe outside, maybe inside. It begins to draw the life out of the host. Begins to feed off the host's strength. Weakens the host. Corrupts the host. Maybe in some cases even leads to the death of the host. Because we see this guy who's going for it. Completely crash and burn. Not in the best way. Because it's not just demonic and paralytic. Excuse me. Demonic and parasitic. It's paralytic. Meaning it completely immobilizes what Peter's to be doing. Peter, you're supposed to be building the church. Peter, you're supposed to be about the kingdom. I'm going back to fishing. What is this something? We call it shame. Shame. We know it. We feel it, don't we? You can feel it now, in fact. It's the, the presence of the word into your space. It's, it's this moment of exposure that results in three things. It results in fracturing. It results in isolating. And it results in contempt. Make sure you write those things down as we understand shame this morning. This demonic parasite that attaches itself to our story. It's a moment of exposure resulting in fracturing, isolating, and contempt. Where the love is gone, the joy is gone, and in many cases, it begins to infect and affect those around you. Let's unpack this definition a little bit. What do I mean when I say a, a moment of exposure? It has to do with how we see ourselves and how we think we are seen by others. Something has happened where the perception of us has been attacked. We've been exposed in some way. It's revealed something of our innermost being and we don't like what it's brought to the surface. It's a moment. It is an actual part of our story. It's not some ethereal thing that's kind of floating out there. It's a part of us. As you think of you, this is a part of it. Peter was seen as a key leader. Peter was seen as a central player in this kingdom thing that Jesus is getting started. And now in a moment of denial, something is exposed in Peter. He doesn't like what he sees. And he's pretty sure everybody else sees it too. Oh, 
He's a fraud. And into that memory is whispered a phrase. The universe doesn't want you. The universe doesn't want you. These three things come along with it. Fracturing. It takes us apart at every possible level. It disrupts our thinking. There's this collision that's happened inside of us mentally. It's as if, how many of you have records? Good old fashioned records. Love records. Anyone who had records still probably has the records, right? And they're good and you love them and they're just, nothing compares to the vinyl. But what's the worst possible thing that could happen to a vinyl? Scratch. So no matter how beautiful that song is, click, click, click. There's a disrupting in the thinking. Whenever you think about your story, you get stuck at that moment. There's been a separation, a detachment, if you will, of everything else that's been going on. And no matter what else is happening, and it can be beautiful, beautiful music. Click, click, click. As it fractures our thinking. It fractures us at an emotional level. Because whatever has happened to us in that moment had a whole lot of emotion poured into it. A feeling of sadness and dejection, a feeling of disgust. And whatever we feel is what gets our attention. Okay? When you feel something, it gets your attention. Case in point. Okay? I walk up to Doug Brooks, I slap him across the face. He feels it. I now have his attention. It just one goes with the other. But something else starts to happen because of the nature of the feeling and the attention. It now solidifies as a memory, a very potent, visceral memory. So much so that if it were Doug, whenever I would walk by, it would trigger in Doug and he would feel it again. Does that make sense? Because whatever I think about in the past becomes my perceived future. This is what's going to happen in the future. If I failed in the past, I'm going to fail in the future. If she hurt me in the past, she's going to hurt me in the future. If he touched me in the past, he's going to touch me in the future. And it just keeps coming back. Click, click, click. And all that emotion that comes along with it. It doesn't just fracture our thinking. It doesn't just fracture our feeling. It locates itself in our body. Which is why if I ask you, Think of a moment in your life that creates shame. You can point to it in your body. You feel it here? Some of you feel it here? Maybe you feel it here? Makes you sick to your stomach. Maybe you feel it up here in your neck. You get all tense. Because you're an embodied being. And the nature of shame is so visceral, you can point to it in your body. I feel it. But it was 20 years ago. But it was 30 years ago. I feel it. I feel it. And the also thing that it fractures is our perception. It breaks the glass of your reality. So that you see reality through a broken lens. You see yourself in a twisted shape. You see everyone else around you in a twisted form. You don't see the world. I don't see the world the way it truly is. Which is why Peter goes back to the old story. Peter who flees out of the garden Peter who denies Jesus three times. Peter who wept bitterly in the presence of that denial. And you can hear him and you can see him running down the streets out of Jerusalem. You can hear the sand scuffing underneath. You can hear the sobbing and you can hear the, and you can hear the anguish and the pain as he goes around a corner. A man who was the central figure to this kingdom movement, defeated and beaten and destroyed as shame tears him apart. Shame fractures us but it also isolates us. And I probably don't have to talk about this one very much, do I? 
You know that this is what shame does. Even when I introduced the word shame, 15 minutes into the message, what did some of you do? Where you looked changed. What you wanted to do with your body, you wanted to cover, you wanted to protect. Because you feel it. You think it, you see it. And you want space away. You want space away from other people because you know they're going to see what you see. And so Peter runs. And I can't afford to have you see what I see. It'll just make it worse. It'll make the pain even greater. And so we get guarded and we push community away because I was hurt before. You're probably going to hurt me again. So just stay back. Or because of how I see myself. I'm just going to stay out of it. I, I can't handle the pain anymore. So I'll just stay busy and I'll push it away. The third thing, though, which is the most telling, is contempt. Contempt. Dan Allender, wonderful Christian thinker, therapist, writer. His name's at the bottom of your notes, along with Kurt Thompson, who's also done a lot of work in this area. If you wanted to study him more, I would recommend these two people. So when it comes to contempt and shame, it's like fire and smoke. You can't separate them. Where there is shame, you will find contempt. Where there's contempt, if you look below the surface, you will probably find shame at a very deep personal level. Contempt, it's the voice that says the universe doesn't want you. But here's the interesting thing. I can direct the contempt towards myself. Because I am so overwhelmed and I'm struggling. I need to cope with this reality that I'm confronted with. So I'm the monster. I'm the villain. I'm unwanted. I'm unlovable. The universe is better off without me. The contempt can be directed towards myself. Or... I can direct the contempt towards others. Because I can't handle that reality. The contempt then overflows to those around me. And the voice of contempt now seeps into the ears of loved ones. Because of what I did, I treat my spouse like a jerk. Because of what I did, I talk to my parents like they're fools. I mock my kids. I disrespect my boss. Wherever you find the one, you will find the other. I attack myself. The universe doesn't want me. No, the universe doesn't want you. And this is the insidious nature of shame. As I get stuck on this record of shame, constantly playing it back and playing it back and playing it back, it then overflows like this cancerous parasite and it infects you. And I gaslight you and you start to believe that the universe doesn't want you. And the record of contempt plays again in your head and in your mind and in your spirit. And then you start to infect others in your circle. This is the insidious nature of shame. It doesn't just go away. Time heals all wounds. Time heals nothing. Time doesn't heal anything. Well, can't we just get beyond it? Can't we just get past it? It's in the past. Leave the past in the past. No. Time heals nothing. 
Okay, I have a son who has an autoimmune disease, okay? That means left to time, time will destroy his body. Time does not heal you. Your immune system heals you. There's intention, there's activity, there's, there's pursuit of. That's what heals. Just leaving something to time will just let it fester. Here's the crazy thing about Peter's story. Okay, after, after his denial, he sees the resurrected Jesus in person. That doesn't fix the shame. He sees Jesus in the upper room. He's surrounded in Christian community. He's engaged in ministry. Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit on him. And he's still riddled with shame. Because you can't just let it go. Because it, like a parasite, has fixed itself into your story. And it's not like some tick that just gorges itself and then releases. Hell is coming after us. It's still there. I have a memory of playing volleyball in high school. Okay? Believe it or not, I was kind of a jock at one time. I even lettered. I had a jacket. And I remember looking up at the stands and not seeing my dad there. I feel it right here. If you were to come up and put your hand on my heart, you would hear, I can feel it right now. That was 25 years ago. I had a great relationship with my dad. Love my dad. But there was a moment of shame that got fixed in my story. How do we heal? How do we get beyond this? Because our emotions, they become a part of our attention, which becomes a part of our memory, which becomes a part of our perceived future. Everyone breathe in. Everyone breathe out. You're okay. Everyone breathe in. Everyone breathe out. I had to do that part so I can do this part. Okay? We're all right. I love you guys. Peter goes fishing. And Jesus comes for Peter's shame. I want to show you this part. How are our stories healed? How are these episodes and moments of shame dealt with? It's two things. In your notes, write this down. It's light and it's love. It's light and it's love. Write that down, and then if you have left, get back to John 21. John 21, I'm going to read verses 15, 16, and 17. John 21, 15, 16, and 17. Peter's out fishing. Jesus meets them there. They have breakfast. I think breakfast helps. <laughs> Absolutely, right, Tom? Breakfast helps. In John 21, verse 15, when they'd finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, listen to what he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Then Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he'd said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
In this moment, when Jesus comes for Peter's shame, we see two very important elements colliding, like a surgeon's scalpel going to the heart of the problem. It's light and love. You can't separate them. You need to have both if shame's going to be excised from the story. If the story's going to be redeemed, it's going to take light and it's going to take love. Some Christians who are jerks just like to wield the lightsaber around. Yeehaw, and it's cutting and maiming everyone left and right. Just bringing everything to light. Not helpful. Some Christians who are naive just like to wield love around, forgetting that love comes with truth. And so nobody ever actually is healed. They're just given a shoulder rub. You need both. And we see both at play within the context of this story. Jesus goes right after it, okay? He's not holding anything back. He is a surgeon in an ER room and he's coming right for the problem and he cuts right to it. He says three times, Simon, son of John. You know why that stands out to me? This is the old story. Who's Simon, son of John? Oh, that's the guy that runs the fishing business. That's the guy who goes out on the water and catches the fish. And Jesus confronts, are we living that story? Is that the story that we want to live now? The old one? I thought you were my Peter who builds the church. Simon, son of John? Let's go to that place where you got stuck in that story. And he exposes it. That place where you felt exposed. The place where you felt the old Simon coming back. And Peter falling away. Let's talk about that moment. He asks him three times. Why did he ask him three times? One would have been plenty. Because Jesus is coming for Peter's shame. And so he asks him three times because Peter denied him three times. And we're coming after that moment. There's no question in Peter's mind what's happening as he lay upon the table in the ER room. We're going to that place. We're dealing with that thing. But then he says, do you love me? This gets lost in our English translation, okay? This is really, really important. Jesus first says this. Do you love me with agape love? Rugged, devotional, passionate love that chases after God the way that God chases after you. Do you agape love me, Peter? Peter's response. Jesus, you know I'm your friend. He comes back with phileo love, friendship love. That's the word that he uses. Jesus uses agape love. Peter comes back with friendship love. Friendship, commitment, and devotion. Peter asks the second time, do you agape love me? Do you, are you devoted to me and love me the way God loves you and the way that God comes after you? Are you chasing after me that way, Peter? Peter does it a second time. You know I'm your friend. And then Jesus makes an amazing decision. He says, okay, Peter, I'll meet you where you're at, buddy. I'll meet you where you're at. Peter, are you my friend? He uses Peter's words. Are you my friend? That's why it says, and Peter was grieved when he said it a third time because the third time he said something different. He took Peter's words and gave them back to Peter. Okay then, if that's where we are, are you my friend? And Peter says, you know everything. You know I'm your friend. And he says, then feed my sheep. In the past, when Jesus had invited Peter to ministry, he used fishing language. You remember that? I will make you a fisher of men. 
Jesus doesn't touch out with a 10 foot pole because we're leaving that behind. We're leaving that story behind. Peter, you're going to build my church. I need you to be a shepherd. I need you to be a pastor. I need you to take care of sheep. That's what I want you to do. Peter, get to back to that identity. Peter, let's get back to that story. This isn't one of those, oh, you screwed up, huh? No ministry for you. Oh, you screwed up. No, no good marriage for you. Oh, you screwed up. You can't be a good parent then. Jesus gets him back to where he was, to the new story with the kingdom purpose. Light and love coming together. And this is, can you see Jesus' love for him in the moment? I think it's Luke's story of the denial. Peter denies, Peter denies, Peter denies. The rooster crows. And it says in that moment, Jesus looked at Peter. Peter, you said you're my friend. You're going to leave me like that? You're going to abandon me like that when everybody else has? And yet it's the love of God incarnate in Jesus that comes after Peter in his shame and his sin and woos him back. Light and love. How do we play this out in our own experience? Let me give you four suggestions on how we need to do this and how we can help each other. Okay, because it takes community. It takes community. How do we heal our stories of shame? First one is this. We need to name the event. Name the event. You need to know something, okay? If you leave here saying, wow, Pastor Paul was on it today. That's because I took everything from guys like Dan Allender and Kurt Thompson who write and preach on this extensively and have just given it to you. This is not my stuff. I am an expert in shame, which means I know shame. I am not an expert in dealing with shame. And so these guys have helped me a lot in my journey. And I want to pass it on to you. But something that they both suggest is you need to name the event. This is what happened, when it happened, where it was. And it probably wasn't just, oh yeah, it was that. No, it's the, what was the sequence of events, the frame by frame in that part of the narrative. We need to get to that place. You need to be sitting with someone who loves you in community and say, hey, it's this. We need to name the event. Number two, within that context, we need to identify the shame. Identify the shame. Okay? This is like a doctor who opens up that necrous wound and is now going to excise that right there. Remember, what is shame? Okay, it's, 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 it's the fracturing. It's the isolation. It's the contempt. When I'm in that place, I hear that and I feel that. Kurt Thompson talks about this when he's in communities of healing. If someone is in that place, he says, where do you feel it? I feel it here. Put your hand there. It's there. Feel it. We're not going to dance around it. Jesus is coming for it. So let's let Jesus know where it is. We need to identify the brokenness. We need to identify the perception. We need to identify the emotion. It's here. It's here. It's when I hear that. And then in that moment, we need to tame the event. You name it so you can tame it. It's not mine. I took it from somebody else. But you can't tame it until you've named it, until you've identified it. This is why it requires a loving community. If you could heal yourself, you would have done it, right? If you had the capacity to confront your shame, you would have done it decades ago when it happened. But you can't. Instead, we've buried it and covered it. But to tame it, we require a loving community who say, as Jesus said to Peter, I'm with you, I'm for you. We're going to move forward in this. 
It's the love of the gospel that needs to come after that shame. And you need to hear it from the other. I testify as one who's been in that place. I've been exhausted by shame. You know what I'm talking about. It saps everything that you have as it sucks your life dry. I'd only known Doug about a year. Internally, I was riddled with shame that I'd carried for a long time. And a moment prompting by the Spirit called him up. I need to come over. And I said it in a way that a friend recognizes this is happening. And I sat. And I relived these moments that shame had grabbed a hold of. Convinced that the universe didn't want me ready to hear the same because that's what it does, right? And he reached down, he grabbed my hand. He says, hey, I'm with you. You are forgiven and you are loved and there's work to do. Similar moments. When my wife didn't have to say anything because love doesn't have to say anything. It can do enough just to say, I'm here. And she grabbed my hand. And gospel grace and divine love floods into the wound. And the parasite can do nothing but die in the presence of Holy Spirit grace. but it takes community that's prophetic and pastoral that's light and love all together it's only possible because of good friday those things can't happen shame thrives outside of the light of Good Friday, but in the presence of gospel, shame dies. Why? Because what happened on Good Friday? He took it all. He didn't just, he didn't hang there in a loincloth. Like that would be worse enough, right? Just to be hanging there in your skivvies. He was completely naked. He was completely vulnerable. All of shame thrust upon him before the entire Roman Empire and Jerusalem and the elite and the powerful. He took it all upon himself. He took my shame. Dan Allender says there's an important aspect to this moment, to tame it. It's a moment of repentance on our part. When we recognize that for however long it had been, we partnered with shame in the process. We partnered with the perpetrator and let the lies spread. I gave shame ground in my life. God, please forgive me. God, I let contempt grow in my heart and I took it out on my spouse and my kids. Please forgive me. And in that, the story has changed. Name the event, identify the shame, tame the event, and then fourthly, retrain. Retrain. Let's get that story back on track. Back on track, back on purpose. Peter, feed my sheep. Peter, tend my sheep. Let's get back to building the church. I am not the choice I made. You are not the sin you committed. If you really want to see this, we have to add one more scene to Peter's story. And that comes in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. 
There's one more word bubble at the top. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit rests upon the disciples in the upper room. Jesus has been ascended. They are sent out to preach the gospels. And who steps to the front? Who steps up to share the message? Not someone riddled with shame. Not someone riddled with self-doubt and sin. Somebody who knows who he is, who has been forgiven and loved and restored. Peter steps up and he preaches the first sermon and thousands are touched. It says this in Acts chapter two, verses 37 and 38. Now, when they'd heard these things, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent, be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter builds the church. Write that down. Peter builds the church. Doug, you want to come back up? Mo, you want to come back up? What story do you want to live? Maybe you're content with the mundane and the mediocrity. Maybe you're content with the hiding. And maybe you're content with the contempt. But maybe some of you aren't. As we sing the next song, we're just going to create space for openness. Let's open up our heart to that place. Let's open up our heart to the healing of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's sitting with a brother and sister, a life group leader, an elder. Maybe it's coming up and just having a moment and crying and saying, this is me. What does James say? Confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. Here's the event. This happened. And I've been carrying it for decades and I'm exhausted. This is what dad used to do when he came home after work. This is what my spouse says to me. I'm starting to think it's true. This is what I said to my kids. This is what happened to me. Let's name it. Let Jesus come for it. Let's leave here lighter. Trophies of love and grace. Stand, would you please? Your challenge in this moment is to let shame win. It's, it's gotten pretty good, hasn't it? Well, I'm afraid if I go up and share someone that I'm broken, then they'll know that I'm broken. <laughs> we know you're broken. Because we're all broken. Good Friday. In the same way that God came for me, I pray that he'd come for you. Holy Spirit, in this space... We present our heart. We print our center story. Some of us, we've gotten off track and we've gotten back to the old name and the old ways. We've given in to the lies of contempt that say that the universe doesn't want us. Good Friday says otherwise. Come for our shame. We want better marriages. Come for our shame. We want to be better parents. Come for our shame. We want to be better friends. We want to be part of a better, healthier church. Forgive us where we've partnered with the lie. Forgive us where we've spread it to others. Because he who began a good work in you will see it through. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So spirit amongst us, in our relationships, in our friendships, come for us today. Thank you for sharing your time with us, and we'd love for the journey to continue. If you're a guest, would you consider reaching out to us? We would love to come alongside and encourage you in any way that we can. 
you're someone who's joined us today and you are desperately reaching to find hope wherever you can, again, Jesus came that we would find hope. You can find hope today. If you want to send us a short note, a member of our hope team would reach out quickly, promptly, to come alongside and see what we can do to encourage you in whatever storm you might find yourself in. That's why Jesus came. That's why we're here. Jesus said there's two ways to live your life. And a wise man, a wise woman, builds their life on Jesus' instructions. God bless.